it's a very interesting topic, of course, and I was actually wondering myself whether you can tackle whether the same experiments that you're holding in California could be extended to other world countries, particularly poor and developed countries like where we come from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here to speak with all of you today. One of the things that I would like to say is that we are in a global drumbeat right at the moment talking about climate change and global warming. One of the things that is affected by climate change is agriculture. But some of what we are seeing is man-made, but man-made in a different way than you may guess. Uh, weather modification programs, experimental ones done by private companies, done by the United States government, uh, done by states across the United States are underway. There's more than 50 of them in operation across the United States. All of these impact agriculture because they change the microclimates needed for agriculture to survive. None of these programs that I know of today, and this is all public record, are available at any time uh, with oversight, agricultural oversight or public oversight. These programs impact agriculture, and there are programs around the world, international corporations are modifying our weather all the time, and they're modifying it in ways that cover thousands and thousands of square miles. Most of it is chemically altered, so that what happens is that we are putting chemicals, ground-based chemicals that are shot into the air, or chemicals coming from airplanes that change and modify our weather. So one of the things that I'm concerned about and that we need to address in the future is how these programs are impacting microclimates needed for our crops to survive and needed for pollination. Um, if we change the growing season, the pollinators may not survive and also our crops, our flowers and our tree crops may not get the pollination needed. So one of my areas is looking at this situation to see if we can begin to put under control experimental and other types of weather modification programs. The other issue is that a lot of times we're talking about mitigation for climate change. It's rather an undefined term at this period of time. And so what happens is that many times we're talking about artificially putting chemicals like sulfur or particulates into the atmosphere in what they call geoengineering schemes to reduce um, and, and help the planet, supposedly, that help the planet to not go through such a tremendous global climate change and to mitigate global warming. However, the incidence of putting chemicals into our atmosphere is going to change and impact agricultural crop production. And if you take and you put up into our skies chemicals to reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the earth, you are going to begin to reduce crop production. Studies at the University of Illinois on corn crop production show reductions. Without the process of photosynthesis, whereby plants from direct sunlight gain the energy to grow, to produce crops, we are going to find ourselves, if we mitigate in that direction, impacting the crop production not only here in the United States, but worldwide. One of the things that is impacting crop production right now in the United States and reducing photosynthesis and also impacting the ability of um, solar power panels to generate the type of, uh, of power that they should is persistent jet contrails. NASA talks about persistent jet contrails as exacerbating global warming because they trap warmth in the atmosphere when they produce cirrus and man-made clouds. NASA also talks about that when we, that these aircraft leaving persistent contrails are changing our climate. And when they change our climate to the degree that one jet can leave a persistent jet contrail which will spread across our skies from what this picture up here on my left on the screen looks like, which is a trail left by a jet. That trail can expand 
to 4,000 kilometers and last for 20 hours. This was unheard of in the early 60s and the 70s, and it wasn't until the late 1980s that there was a change and we started to have persistent jet contrails that persist. NASA studies show that part of our global warming problem could be attributed to these types of contrails and the jets that leave them. So one of the issues as we go through is how do you like your skies, natural or man-made? And right now, we are making man-made clouds, and this is trapping warmth in our atmosphere. The climate change that is produced by these jets, not all jets, mostly some non-commercial, but what happens to our skies is that we start to see the changes. The man-made clouds do trap the warmth and they increase the humidity. This allows for pests to proliferate, diseases, molds, mildews, funguses, and viruses. This is a man-made cloud, ladies and gentlemen, and these pictures I took myself over Northern California, and this is a burst. Uh, this is where a jet left a hot, huge plume and then this turned in at the end of it to a burst. And this is not uh, normal. Never seen before in our county historically, and I was born and raised there. This is another picture showing the jet trail just before the burst. This is our skies. And I want you to know that what you're seeing now, a lot of times many scientists know, especially at NASA and in other areas, that the skies that we're seeing are not normal cloud formations. These are man-made. And what happens as we reduce the amount of sunlight in a form of global dimming, we reduce the solar power with these type of clouds, and we reduce photosynthesis, which is going to impact agriculture. The pictures look odd. The formations don't look like normal clouds that people have seen before historically. Uh, this is another type of man-made cloud. And what we have done and what you're seeing here is we have the photographs from the times that the jet leaves the first trail as a thin spindly trail to where they form into these different types of cloud formations. All of you can start looking up and seeing this. What happens is that there are experiments, and there's a color. You can see some color in this photograph. And part of what we're doing also is we're sending up canisters. The United States government, NASA, the US Air Force, is sending up canisters into the atmosphere filled with chemicals to modify and experiment with our, 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 our ionosphere. And when we modify and experiment with our ionosphere up here, we create experiments which they can see through these persistent jet contrails as they stay in the sky for long periods of time. And they can watch the experiments. The type of chemicals they are using are aluminum, barium, strontium. And these canisters are sent up on rockets. And what they do is they superheat the canisters to create experiments in our atmosphere. The experiments can give you colorful auroras, which they talk about as being wonderful. Many times people think that the auroras in, in Alaska and, and the ones we see are normal, but there's beginning to be more and more seen across the United States and elsewhere where um, aluminum, trimethyl aluminum experiments to make clouds are beginning to impact us. The reason I am concerned for agriculture is that none of these experiments have any public oversight nor agricultural oversight. Our drinking water is impacted because the chemicals are now beginning to show up in our drinking water. In California, the State Department of Health drinking water tests were examined between 1970 and this year. And we found unusual spiking in barium, aluminum, strontium, magnesium, calcium, manganese. And all of these spiked at the same time in various drinking water supplies across the state of California and also in Arizona. So what's happening with these atmospheric tests is that aluminum, as one example, gets into, with increased pollution, and acid rain gets into the root systems of our crop trees and our trees, and it looks like the trees are dying of drought. 
but they're not. What happens is that the root systems can no longer absorb the water and the nutrients needed to survive. Many of our forests in Redding, California and other areas are dying. The oak trees, the redwood trees, the Douglas fir across the United States, many areas. We believe that these trees are impacted because they cannot absorb enough water because aluminum is going into their root systems. Also molds, mildew and fungus from warmer temperatures produced by persistent jet contrails are also allowing pests and molds to proliferate, also impacting tree health and crop health. The skies that you see up here, it is important to note, um, have a white haze to them. When crossing the United States two days ago, we saw this man-made produced haze all the way across the United States. There were a few real clouds. We saw the persistent jet contrails from the jet windows, and the skies in the white haze looked a lot like this. So one of the things that we need to really look at is that jet fuel emissions contaminate our air, much as automobile exhaust. They know from scientific studies back in the, in the 1970s that uh, they deplete beneficial ozone in the atmosphere by releasing nitric acid. So one of the things that we need to look at is the impact of just jet fuel and just the emissions from jets as well. I want to go on and talk briefly about a couple of issues here that I think are important for everyone to realize. If we don't look at the problems that we are creating, the atmospheric testing programs, the jet, in other words, the jet contrails that are warming our climate, and we say to ourselves, we want to geoengineer something else. We want to add more particulates to help global warming or to stop climate change. What we're going to have is we're going to have a pea soup up there of chemicals which are going to be detrimental to our health. It is much better to take the EPA model of the 1970s where the Environmental Protection Agency was designed to put in regulations to reduce the pollution at its source, to reduce and put caps on how much pollution corporations, cars, automobiles were putting into the atmosphere. One of the things that we're talking about as mitigation is to go into geoengineering plans which add more chemicals to our atmosphere, which are going to get into our drinking water supplies, which are going to get into our soils, which are going to impact our trees. Our trees across the United States, many of them in many areas, especially Mendocino, Lake, and Sonoma County, are dying. They are not healthy as they used to be. And this problem, having traveled across the United States into some other areas, seeing the pictures coming in from across the, the United States and, a, pardon me, and other countries, we're finding that there's beginning to be an impact from all of these programs and all the chemicals in our skies. And so one of the things we need to think about and work for is reducing pollution. Alan Buck from, Buckman from uh, the California State Department in Fish and Game talked about microbes, and they're important to the environment. We have at our disposal already some technologies and already the wherewithal to begin to make the planet more healthy and to put it into a different perspective. But if we go to the geoengineering schemes that are waiting in the wings, thousands of them, to put the particulates up and sulfur, then we are going to be in trouble with agriculture across the United States and around the world. It is time that we look at some different solutions that are already here, and it's time that we look at what's happening in our skies and say we don't need to add any more chemicals, we are doing enough. And what these experiments in our skies are doing with atmospheric heating and testing, we don't know, but the chemicals are showing up in our drinking water. So in closing, I would like to say to all of you and to encourage you to know that just what I showed you today is beginning to impact crop production in the United States. And we're seeing higher UV radiation that is burning the tips of our trees and our plants. We see the molds and mildews growing here. 
And we see all of this, and we hope that all of you will consider before you think of mitigation and just go forward with some of the plans that are, that are being sold to you as almost a cap-and-trade situation where a corporation like Plankos decides to put iron dust into the Galapagos Islands area. This is a proposal, may have already started, and to create algae blooms. And yes, they're saying, yes, we're going to help the environment because we're going to create these algae blooms with, for more oxygen. But what happens is it's going to impact the marine life in those areas. As a geoengineering plan, it is going to be sold the credits for this, their, the, the supposed benefits, is to be sold to, as credits to people who want to pollute more. And here is, the, here is the really awful twist to this, in my opinion, is if we sell pollution credits to polluters to ask them so that they can pollute more, we're only going to add more to our climate change and to our global warming processes. We have to say, no, we don't want money market schemes that are going to go into the ocean and change something possibly to the detriment of our oceans or our air in order to sell credits to someone who wants to pollute more. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a consideration for all of you when you start to talk about caps and trades, when you start to talk about geoengineering plans, because we don't need a money market scheme. We need to have and use the microbes available to us, the science available to us, to reduce the pollution that we're putting into the atmosphere. And we need a new direction. And I think that this might be a good one. So I hope that all of you will consider what I have to say today. And I want to thank you once again for um, listening to what I had to say. Thank you.